Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of For the Love of Marketing. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, web design and everything associated with that. Um, so don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll get stuck in. Um, I want to welcome our guest, Carl Hewitt, this morning, who is the CEO and co-founder of Hewitt Matthews, who are a fantastic web design and development company uh, based out of the UK, but working with clients around the world. Um, we've known each other for a little while, um, and uh, I'm a big fan of what the, the, the business does. So, uh, so we're going to talk through a bunch of trends, um, ways to work in web design, things to look out for today that hopefully will help you guys out. Um, hi, Carl. Hi, Simon. Thanks for having me. So, right, how are you doing on this lovely Friday afternoon? Yeah, all good, all good. That's Friday afternoon. We've got a long weekend ahead of me as well, so that's always nice. Um, yeah, but yeah, so doing well. Every time I talk to you, I'm so jealous. You've got a nice nice river flowing past the back, and I've basically <laughs> just got a car park outside my window. So. <laughs> that's all right. I don't get to look that way. Everyone else gets to see it. I, I look <laughs> at the screen. So. <laughs> awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, cool. So um, we're going to yeah chat through a bunch of stuff today. The, the first topic um, to dig into is sustainable web design, right? So this is a uh, a phrase um, that's thrown around a little bit. There's a lot, a lot of phrases thrown around around sustainability and they all mean slightly different things um, these days. But tell me about sustainable web design. What is it? Yeah, so at the moment, it feels like a massive buzzword that nobody quite has got into enough yet to really action it. And it's quite, it's kind of being banded about. But the, put very simply, it's, it's essentially building, designing um, and hosting your site in a way that's uses the least amount of energy is most sustainable for the planet. So um, to give some context, so the internet as a whole every year uses essentially the same amount of energy as the United Kingdom does. So it's about 400 terawatts a year, terawatt hours a year, um, which is obscene amounts of energy. And everyone's, you know, it's, it's right down to those things. When your laptop starts whirring, it sounds like it's going to take off and explode. All that is like wasted energy with your laptop trying to load these huge files from websites that, just haven't been optimized properly and it's a case of saying that not only is it great for user experience to focus on this kind of stuff but for the environment um, it's a massive thing you know if you, if you improve the efficiency of websites and um, you can reduce the energy usage as well and there's, there's a lot of easy fixes around it but it's just being wary of it yeah well, we had a recent uh, podcast with michelle carvel who um who writes uh, books about sustainable marketing and um, sustainability and she has a podcast um, can marketing save the planet so really really good stuff I mean it's a really hot topic at the moment and I think um, you know, there's there's a lot that people appreciate in terms of we need to message this and we need to have some sort of strategy and we need to have you know distribution um, uh, platform or, or methodology that that um, that works well from a sustainability perspective but I think people often don't think about this and from a web design perspective and it, it, it is a hot topic that um, that I think um, we as marketers should be considering. Now, like you say, a, a slow site, a site stuffed full of code or with large images or something that's going to grind it out is not a great experience for a user anyway. But the impact on the energy that that uses is is incredible. And, and that stat, I haven't heard that one before, that the, the, the internet uses the same amount of power as the UK. And we all know what UK's power prices are like at the moment. So God knows what it would cost to run the internet. But um, but yeah, it's um, that's some that's some fascinating um, context. I mean, how do we how do you do that? How do you build a website then that uses less power so as we can be more sustainable? Yeah, that's a really good question. And there there is so much that can happen. And the the thing that I really love about this is it does fall with everyone involved in the process. It's not just uh, you know the, the hosts need to be wary of it or the developers. It's everything right down to the copywriting team, the SEO team, because to put it really bluntly, there's a, there's a few different areas, but it's it's how quickly can you get a user to the content they want to see and in the lightest way. So, you know, with SEO, for example, if you start right at the beginning, like that is comes into sustainability, because if you can get the right page, at the right place on Google quickest, then you're not wasting time loading pages and then backing out and bouncing because it wasn't right for you. And spending loads of time trying to find this information, your prominent front and center if your SEO is good. So you're saving wasted page loads. The same is true with copywriting and design for UX. You know, if your copy is engaging, people can understand what they need to understand quicker. They're not going to load unnecessary pages and they can convert and do what they want. Same with UX. And it's all the reasons we talk about a frictionless experience. You know, friction wastes energy. It's a very similar kind of thing, right? Mm. And so it all comes down to that side of things to begin with, like in the design phase, but also in the development phase. So there's lots of different things you can do from 
simply using sort of clean code and not wasting loads of time with unnecessary scripts. Um, one thing I found quite interesting was using less JavaScript is actually a really good way to, to save energy. So um, JavaScript adds a lot of weight and sort of processing requirements more so than, than other types of, of code. So um, using less of that actually tends to basically put less load on the server to pull down those size files um, when they're loading your site. Things like even up to the file types you use on your fonts. So like um, WOFF and WOFF2 have a higher compression than TTF or OTF files or SVG. So they're quicker to load, lighter to pull from a server and therefore less energy. All these types of things you can think about. And then on the host side of things at the last stage, you know, you're looking at caching, using CDNs, um, finding servers and, and hosts that have a, a good uh, power usage efficiency rating, mm. renewable energy, uh, host, you know, Google Cloud's great with that. Um, so there's a, a whole multitude of things we can do that aren't really too difficult. And to be honest, I imagine a huge percentage of, of good developers and designers are already designing with sustainability in mind. They just don't know it because mm. they're designing for the user's experience and they kind of go hand in hand. So I think it's worth yeah, putting that front of mind, though. I mean, I think as a you know as a marketing leader in you know, whatever business you're in, I think it's worth considering these things. And you don't need to be a technology expert to understand that you know JavaScript is going to take a a big load, or the larger images, or any of these other pieces you're talking about. You don't need to understand that necessarily as the as the marketing leader. But I think asking that question of whoever is developing your site and looking at the site you've got. And considering that angle to if this is slow to load, if this is causing um, your, your heavy, as you say, heavy server loads, anything like that, that's considering it from a sustainability, not just from an SEO or user experience. That, that for me feels like a, a, you know, a new angle that every marketing leader, a web designer, developer, et cetera, should be considering within their standard process. If we're going to really make a dent on the sustainability issue, this environmental issue that we all know we, we have nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. That's really good. That's really that's really that's really interesting, Carl. I, I hope I hope people listening have, can take something away from that. I certainly have done. So that's fantastic. Um, let, let's let's move on to talk about something else. Um, yeah, it, that's that's one of the trends in the moment. Um, mm. And and you, there are also you know, I have a lot of conversations myself with people who are doing uh, building building new websites. You know, as you know, we help a lot of companies build out their their marketing strategies uh, worldwide. Um, and as part of that. You know, a lot of the time a new website or a refresh or something comes in into play um now as you know we don't do design and development as such ourselves, although we do do you know, systematic sort of overall design and branding for organizations but what, what trends do you see out there at the moment because there's a lot of uh, you get a lot of comments from potential clients and clients saying hey, i just want my site to be more modern right or i want it to yeah. be at the moment right but what does that mean what i mean that can mean a million things to different people so yeah, you're probably a bit finger on the pulse a bit more than i am on on design trends what do you see as, as common trends at the moment? Yeah, and you know, it's a really good point that, you know, the, the word sort of clean, modern, um, slick, you know, all that kind of stuff always comes out in those discovery meetings. And it's, it's a very subjective phrase because what's modern for you might be very different for someone else. And one of the most interesting ones that I've found, actually, <clears throat> is something called Memphis Design. And it's, um, you know, it, it's one thing, what is the trend at the moment and what a lot of these kind of really cutting edge brands are doing. And then also, what clients are comfortable with getting into that because you can kind of have that boundary and memphis design is one that's really sort of captured my imagination anyway because you know 2020 onwards was was pegged to be this new spearhead of design you know we don't know what's going to come out of it let's see what these people come up with but actually what's happened is a lot of people have really jumped into memphis design which is pretty much the opposition of minimalism it's like from the 1980s and we're, we're now going in this cyclical loop again, which we kind of know happens with design anyway and mm. with trends and fashion. But mm. people are picking up this kind of 80s design, um, which is a lot more retro, kind of pops of color, older style fonts and, and text and, and layout. But I really love it. I think it looks so good. And there's some really good um, sort of consumer brands doing this and some really good agencies right at the front of it, really sort of pushing it forward. So that's certainly one to look out for. Uh, I think looking backwards more to to go forward because we've been, we've done a lot of this now. The, re the rebellion against the sort of clean minimalist design, if you like. So there's there's a fantastic um, car rental leasing company called Ling's Cars. I don't know if you've ever come across them. 
Yes. Is this the one where you can see them all on live stream as well? Have you, you can seen... see them on live yeah. stream. <laughs> And it's, it's everything that's wrong with a website, right? If you were to write a book about how to write, how to build a website, it's completely wrong in every single way. You know, there's flashing things, things moving around all over the place. You can't work out where to look or what to click on or what's going on. And yet it's completely addictive, uh, this, this website. And I'm sure she does incredibly well um, with, with her brand. I know she's been featured on TV and all sorts of things, but yeah, absolutely crazy website. Um, but yeah, it works. It shouldn't work, but it does work because it's breaking those conventions right we you know we're in this place where it's certainly businesses like like apple and, and google and you know, many others over uh, the you know, the early days of the internet the early 2000s were really going for minimalist white space keep it really clean and you know, from a design perspective yeah those are good principles but i think um everyone because everyone started to copy that you know it's now it's now really just very much a, a generic style and yes, you can look like that, but you're probably going to look like all your competitors and three other websites that person's just been to and you become yeah. forgettable, right? You become just just nothing. So, so I think it's really interesting. I'm not suggesting everyone goes out and copies links, cars, and we have all kinds of flashing buttons everywhere. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's, it's good to find your niche and within your brand and your values to find a design that, that, that stands out and really represents that in an interesting, unique way, rather than just uh, going, let's be, let's be like Apple, which I think happens a lot of the time. Um, I think that's that, that's great. It's good to hear that. I haven't heard the term Memphis design before, though, so um, that's quite nice. I don't know if it's anything to do with Elvis or... Um, yeah, I'm not too sure. I think it was to do with where it originated, but I'm not too sure. I just know that's the name for it. I should really look, look into that. <laughs> Very good. Very good. So what, one of the other challenges on, um, on web design... Um, and sort of digital journeys more 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 um, generally is is conversion rate optimization right so you know i mean ultimately most of most businesses out there want someone to do something on the website then don't most of them don't exist just to exist and they want you to take a, an action whether that's a leader a sale or, or an engagement in some way um and there's a lot i mean this is an area that i've looked at a lot in my career um done a lot of work with and i know you have as well so yeah what's what, um Tell, tell me about tell me about conversion rate optimization. I mean, what what makes a conversion, and how how do you think people should be? What are some tips, I suppose, for people to help them drive conversion across their site? Yeah, so I, th I think this is a really interesting one because it really marries what you do with what we do, um, and they're kind of both of our our areas of expertise. And you know, you would have seen firsthand just how important that number is in terms of your conversion rate. You know, if you're converting two percent of visitors, and uh, you know, you get hundred visitors and get two sales you bump that up by 1%, you get three sales, that's a massive impact on the bottom line. You know, if you're making a thousand pounds a sale, there's a huge amount that you've just, by increasing that by 1%, but people rarely look to that to really test because it's quite a long-term strategy where you have to put in place a, what's called a hypothesis and they take it very scientific approach, but mm. a hypothesis with this, and then you, you make a change to the design and then you monitor that. And then, you know, you guys will come in, you'd be running, that paid media piece, getting the traffic through, we can then analyze what's working, what isn't. And I think a lot of people, they jump straight into that end conversion of a sale or of someone filling out a contact form as the one and only conversion. There's, there's no steps in between. People hit my website and they buy something from me. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's so many micro conversions along that journey that you've got to optimize for to get that end result. It's not just the one and done. And um, you know, that might be the download a white paper day one um, and then they come back in a week and then they might read a blog or, you know, scroll all the way down through that and it depends how good your tracking is as to how much you can know. But it's all of these little things you've got to optimise for um, and test the changes to then get that ultimate goal. Um, so again, a lot of this is quite relevant and, and ties together, but it's that user experience design, make it so frictionless, you know, understanding what these people have come to find out on your website and design the journey to that. It's very, very um, easy to do when you know how, because you've got the clients already, you've got the people you've sold to. So speak to them, why do they come to you? What's the biggest problem or issue they've got? What do they want to find out from a company like you? And build your site around that, you know? And I think one of the real key things that, that again, marries up the, the marketing web is showing your customer what they want to see, not what you want to sell them all yeah. the time. Because yeah. that's really where the value comes in. Um, and that's how you increase your, your conversions without a doubt. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And you know I agree with that point um, very strongly that ultimately marketing is about you know, solving problems, really. I mean, you know, someone has something that they want to 
buy or learn or 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 you know, understand or trade or whatever it is or sell you know what they have a, a specific action they're trying to take whatever that action is um and you need to solve that for them it's not about shouting about how great you are it's about mm-hmm. solving that problem for that individual and that's where those conversion points need to be put in um so yeah that might be the sale but like you say those micro conversions are important you know have they looked at that product have they gone to that sort of shopping category section in which case they're definitely at least considering if not purchasing at the moment and therefore you know that's a stronger visitor than it is someone who just read your blog and disappeared right so those micro conversion points are i think critical along the way and then of course yeah i always talk about green buttons and smiling humans those are two things i'm big fans on (laughs) conversion journeys um as well as signposting anything that that explains to you exactly very clearly what you need to do and if something goes wrong it explains you very clearly why it's gone wrong um, i think any generic messages around um, you made a mistake fix it it's not helpful <laughs> generally in a form because if you made a mistake often you don't know why that's considered a mistake and therefore you don't know how to fix it so i think you know a lot of that um reviewing your your help messaging your error messaging and and, and your your coloring of your buttons and the the sim- you know, shortness and simplicity of your journeys as well for me and CRO is, is so important. Um, yeah. the, the last hot topic I wanted to touch on um, with you today was accessibility. Um, this is another one that I feel um, you know, like sustainability and, and sometimes like CRO um, gets forgotten, um, especially mm-hmm. in the web design process. Not with you guys. I know you guys don't forget it, but I know <laughs> some people do. Um, and I think you know, when I've when I've gone through even working with other web design companies or or, or graphic designers or other marketers, um, when I've seen websites put together that just you know, have very low contrast ratios or very small fonts, and yeah, you know, it looks really beautiful from a design perspective. Yeah, but this is not a press advert. This is a digital experience, and therefore it has to work for everybody. You can't move this closer. You can't turn the page. Right? It's, it has to work for everybody it has to be accessible not just because that's the right thing but also because you're going to get penalized by uh, google and the likes if you don't uh, make it make it the right thing so yeah there are obviously some specific rules around this so jordan talk a little bit about that and just make sure everyone understands the importance of this and why it has to be thought about in any web project yeah absolutely and and this is the thing i think it's it's such a waste you know even if you're looking at this from not just a a uh, personal point of view whereby you're excluding someone being able to use your website and, and how hard that must be for them but for you you're, you're wasting what could be a great customer someone who wants to work with you by not making this accessible and just closing the door because you know they may have a, a, a different disability that you haven't accounted for and it's um it's one of those things that is constantly changing and evolving and uh, it can be difficult for businesses to try and keep up to date with this when they're running a million and one other things but mm. like you say you need to be considering um, you know, how easy is it to read based on, on contrast, your font size, what types of font have you used? You know, we did um, we did a focus group a few years ago with a, a national charity called Headway, and it's a brain injury charity. And they were looking at redesigning one of their local websites uh, up in London for one of their sort of areas that they covered. And we had to sit down with with about probably about 15 of, of the, the people that worked with them who had brain injuries and would have been using the site. And it was so interesting to speak to them and see from their point of view, sort of like, you know, one guy was saying to me, I, I can't use a site if there's animations on there that I can't stop from, from, from moving. Mm. You know, if, they, if they're moving on autoplay, I can't use the site. It just doesn't work for me. Someone else is saying the same with videos or with overly bright content where they couldn't change the background color. Um, but it's all very, very easy if, again, you know how. So there's a, a, a tool called Site Improve, which is excellent for this. And... Um, they're really pushing the the accessibility um, sort of pass on this and, and really at the forefront of it. And this tool that they have not only helps you get compliant in the first place, but it allows us to run regular reports on are you remaining accessible? Because this is another thing we have is we hand over a site to a client. They continue to update it themselves internally. And before you know it, the site's been edited and is no longer accessible and in line with these web content accessibility guidelines. Um, and so this, it checks you for that regularly and gives you the fixes on how to remain compliant. And with them, um, you know, we've all seen um, WCAG 2.1, AA uh, certified, all this stuff. But it's actually 2.2 is coming out in December this year. We're expected to be published in December this year. 
with um, 3.0 also being out sort of as a white paper at the moment. We're not sure when that's going to come out, but it will keep you up to date with those things as well. And um, it's important to note that when 3.0 comes out, you won't automatically be um, compliant just because you're 2.1 or 2.2 compliant. It's a new guideline altogether. And so you need to be looking at that, that, you know, any compliance is great, but worth considering all of it. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, the the joy that we're all going to have when we have to re accessibilize uh, accessibilitize. Oh, what's the word? Mm. I don't yeah, know. accessibilitize is probably the best one. I think. Yeah, it sounds fun. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> whatever the word is, uh, when we have to go through that whole process all over again. But it is it is really important. I mean, I, I'm um, I, I sit on the board of a, a migraine charity, uh, National Migraine Centre, who do some fantastic work um, in the UK for people suffering from migraines, which is you know, something that for me is really undervalued as a as a condition it's, it's a hard thing to have to deal with uh, and my wife deals uh, deals with it herself it's, it's tough um and you know that that is something that absolutely can be triggered by you know flashing lights and bright experiences and you know, it's easy if you don't have any of these um disabilities any of these issues um yourself um to to sort of belittle them and forget them and say hey look it's okay yeah mm-hmm. that font's a bit small but that's all right most people will be able to read it well yeah most people will but that's not fair. You know, we've got to make this right for everybody. There should be a level playing field. Um, so, and, you know, as a result, you know, we need to be thinking very carefully about that. And there's you know, the things I see that get forgotten all the time as well are things like alt tags, which, you know, I think people think oh, it's such a small thing. It won't bother because it's not going to make a big difference on SEO. Well, OK, yeah, I mean, there's an SEO benefit to it. But, you know, primarily that's for accessibility. Right. I mean, that's for those people who can't see those images uh, who are using screen readers. So you know, I think thinking about um, uh, accessibility not just as as i have to do this for my website so as it works but you know to really genuinely provide a, a a level playing field for everyone who has and needs different experiences i think is absolutely an essential consideration so i'm, I'm as much as it can be a pain in the process i'm really mm. pleased that websites with poor accessibility get penalized i think it's absolutely the right thing yeah i totally agree i think it's one of those things is you know, we, we actually, one of my favorite designs we've ever done is just the finalized stage of, of build at the moment is for an accessibility um, and inclusion charity. Great. And and so, you know, working with a couple of different uh, not-for-profits in that space on site projects, actually. But um, this design, I love it. And it's, I think the worry a lot of people have is that designing for accessibility takes away a certain amount from what you can do to create a beautiful design because you're limited or you feel limited mm. by what can be done. And actually, if, if you get, the the basics right not only does it still look amazing but again the user experience is is usually better because you're looking at kind of low low effort sites so that it's easy and simple to navigate clear to understand what's there and it all ties back in with all these different things and there's a video actually um which is worth watching literally just called how a blind person uses a computer right and it sounds so straightforward but if you watch that video you realize like just how different the experience is things you could never never fathom like you know finding the keys or using a mouse seeing what's on the screen obviously and reading these alt tags out loud is totally different and the whole experience is is polar opposite and i think once you've seen that you sort of think oh okay yeah you know, we really need to account for these types of things yeah i agree it's really interesting look carl thanks very much that's been really really helpful there's some great stuff there on on web design and, and things i think uh, all of our our listeners can uh, can take away as, as useful tips um, and things to consider as part of their projects going forward. So, um, yeah, I'd recommend anyone who's looking for some help with web design to reach out to Carl and the team over at Hewitt Matthews. They're a great company. They work with some fantastic people. Um, and I think I've been winning award after award recently. So um, I would <laughs> definitely recommend working with these guys. Um, thanks for listening to For the Love of Marketing. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. And uh, we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks, Carl. Amazing. Thanks, Simon. Cheers. Cheers.